This voiceover deals with how cells direct the traffic of the proteins they make. It looks at how proteins produced on ribosomes in the cytoplasm might end up in the nucleus and mitochondria, or how they might end up in the rough endoplasmic reticulum as the first stop on the way to a lysosome or even to being secreted outside of the cell. That is to say, how do proteins know to be packaged into rough ER, in fact, removed from the cytosol and put into any one of the organelles, including RER, mitochondria, chloroplasts, etc. Let's take a moment to consider where all of these internal cellular membranes might have come from. You may recall that we have an explanation for the origin of mitochondria and chloroplasts. These were free-living prokaryotes at one time, either bacteria in, in the case of mitochondria or photosynthetic bacteria, blue-green algae, in the case of chloroplasts that somehow got engulfed by a primitive eukaryotic cell and instead of being digested to nothingness were kept and became endosymbionts and hence the endosymbiotic hypothesis might explain the origin of these particular organelles and you'll remember that supporting that uh, endosymbiotic hypothesis is the fact that both chloroplasts and mitochondria actually have their own DNA uh, and they make some of their own proteins. It turns out, however, that most of the proteins in a mitochondrion or a chloroplast are not actually encoded on the DNA in those organelles, but are made from genes in the nucleus of the host cell, and therefore these proteins have to move from the cytosol into those organelles. Well, this illustration from your textbook suggests what might have been the origin of the intracellular membranes, specifically the endomembrane system, which actually includes the nucleus. So we have on the left a prokaryotic cell with its DNA. We know that the DNA of bacteria is not free-floating in the cytoplasm of the cell, but is actually attached at one point to the cell membrane, and so that's shown here. We also know that bacteria have ribosomes translating the messenger RNAs into polypeptides that end up outside the cell, essentially secreted proteins. And these ribosomes are actually attached to the cell membrane. So this is already known. And so the idea is that at some point, an ancient prokaryotic cell might have experienced what's called an invagination, an inward growth of some membrane, including that part of the membrane which would have ribosomes on it. And you can see the beginnings in the middle picture, the beginnings of a membrane that might eventually enclose a nucleus and actually contain ribosomes bound to it. And then later, an ancient eukaryotic cell would have a primitive nucleus, presumably with nuclear pores, because today's eukaryotic cells have nuclear pores, which contains the DNA inside the nucleus and which is intimately associated with endoplasmic reticulum. These are things that we talked about earlier in the semester when we just talked about cell structures in general. So this should look familiar. So we have an idea of how the endomembrane system, the intracellular membranes, might actually have evolved. And when we have that idea, along with the endosymbiotic hypothesis, we really are talking about how eukaryotic cells might have evolved from a primitive bacterium or other prokaryote. Now let's just take a look at this illustration of a gut cell, a gut endothelial cell, because it has most of the kinds of internal membranes that we find in cells. Cells, when they differentiate, may not have to do a lot of secretion, and so they might not have a lot of RER and Golgi, but gut cells, which do a lot of secretion of enzymes that end up in the gut, have all of the membranes. And of course, all cells have mitochondria, uh, and all eukaryotic cells have a nucleus. So here we see in, in profusion all the different kinds of membrane-bound compartments in the cell. How does a cell know to put the right proteins in the right places in the cell, in the cytosol, in the RER, in a lysosome, in a peroxisome, in the various organelles that you see here? This module will begin the process of explaining that, uh, and another module will cover some of the finer points. The signal hypothesis explains how secretory, lysosomal, or other packaged or vesicular proteins are actually produced and processed. This uh, slide begins a discussion of the first observations that led us to think there might be something different about the synthesis of secretory proteins, proteins that will be released from the cell, compared to those which are kept inside the cell, say in the cytosol. Proteins like those of the glycolytic pathway, all of which are cytosolic enzymes that have to stay in the cytoplasm. Various researchers were studying a cancer uh, of the mouse, a myeloma, an immune system cell, and in this mouse, these cells developed to produce only one of the polypeptide chains of an antibody molecule, 
of an, of an immunoglobulin G molecule. So they only produced one of the chains, and it was the smaller of them, called the IgG light chain. Now, this IgG light chain was produced by cells like this in culture and secreted into the medium of that culture. So if you grew these cells up, after a period of time, you could just simply suck up some of the medium and actually look at the IgG light chain, which was the predominant secretory product of this cell. So if you added radioactive amino acids to this culture and waited a little bit, the radioactive amino acids would be incorporated into radioactive proteins, which would make the culture medium radioactive. So if you spun the cells in a centrifuge tube like this and threw away the cells, you would end up with the medium, which was radioactive because it had radioactive polypeptides, most of which are radioactive IgG molecules, or light chain of the IgG. With a little bit of protein purification, you end up with nothing but radioactive IgG light chain polypeptides. And if you were to put that into the slot or well of a polyacrylamide gel, you can separate the IgG molecule from any other remaining polypeptides by size, by molecular weight. So we're going to put that radioactive IgG preparation, partially if not fully purified, into lane two, the second lane that the arrow is pointing to. We're going to put some molecular size markers, just the proteins we've got off the shelf of different sizes, into the first lane, and we're going to run the electrophoresis. We're going to stain the gel for proteins. So now you see, what is it, three, four, five, six uh, marker proteins of known molecular weight, and you see uh, a protein from this medium also migrating there. We made a small amount radioactive to show that these cells are actually synthesizing uh, IgG for a short time before we harvest the medium. However, the cells have been growing in the medium for quite a while and have produced a lot of IgG, which is enough to be picked up by the stain on the gel. But we also know that the small amount that was made in, say, a half an hour, an hour of culture, not shown here in terms of time, that small amount will have been made radioactive, and so we also have radioactive IgG, and it'll be obvious why we want that in a moment. In a separate experiment, we take cells from this culture and basically toss the medium, just to spin down the cells in a centrifuge tube, grind up the cells shown here in a tissue grinder, and do an RNA extraction, an RNA purification. So you have a test tube at the end of this process which contains pure RNA from these cells. Now this RNA contains mRNA for the IgG light chain. So you can add the components that you need, the, the ingredients that you need, to do in vitro translation or cell-free translation, as it's called here. What are those ingredients? Well, they'll include ribosomes, right? They're probably ATP to provide energy for translation. You remember the translation is energy intensive. And several other components that you will need in order to do cell-free protein synthesis. And what you're asking in this blue arrow is, given the material, the machinery you need to make proteins, will that machinery take the RNA in this extract, specifically the messenger RNA, will the ribosomes bind to it, and will the ribosomes translate an IgG or any other polypeptide? Now, in doing this, you're not going to get a lot of IgG. So here, we've added radioactive amino acids to ensure that when we do make a small amount of IgG, we'll be able to use the radioactivity of the newly made proteins to see the protein having been made. Okay, so now this tube uh, at the bottom now should contain radioactive IgG light chain and perhaps a few other proteins that might have been produced because of the different messenger RNAs that might have been present in this cell when the RNA was extracted. Okay, we're now going to purify the IgG that was made from any other proteins that might have been produced because we're really not interested in the other protein. We know how to purify IgG, so we just go through the motion of purifying it the way we did up on the top of this slide, except we're doing a sort of micro-scale purification, because we know there's not a lot of it. What we should have in the test tube at the bottom right so far anyway, is a preparation of reasonably pure radioactive IgG light chain polypeptides that was made by in vitro or cell-free translation. We can take some of that, and we will put that material on the third lane of this gel and we'll run a gel which contains the markers and also contains a radioactive IgG light chain polypeptide made by living cells. We'll have three lanes then filled with stuff. We'll run the gel, we'll go ahead and stain it, and what we would see, let me go back one, after staining it, we will see the markers 
we will see the IgG from the culture because the cells have been sitting in that culture for a long time and have made plenty of IgG and we can actually see it by staining. When we stain the gel, we won't see anything on the third lane because we didn't make enough IgG to really pick up with stain. So how do we detect the IgG that would have been made during the cell free translation process, the small amount that would have been made radioactive? Well, you do autoradiography, which is you put a piece of film on top of the gel and you'll be able to expose for a period of time, develop the film, develop the autoradiograph, and wherever there was radioactivity, you will see a band or a spot representing where the radioactive proteins went. And so if you look at this autoradiograph, you will see that there are two bands. The marker lane doesn't show up on the autoradiograph because it wasn't radioactive to begin with. The IgG produced by the cells, which we then purified from the culture medium, was made radioactive for a brief time before we extracted the medium. And so it is actually also radioactive. And the radioactive spot forms at the same position, if you look at it carefully, at the same position as the stain for the IgG in the second lane. Should be no surprise there. The IgG made by in vitro or cell-free translation is also showing up. When this experiment was done, the expectation was that the second band should be right next to the first one, meaning it should be the same size as the material made by the cells. And as you can see, it represents a spot that on the gel was migrating more slowly. It didn't get as far from the well as the secreted IgG produced by the culture. On these gels, faster moving molecules are smaller. Slower moving molecules are larger. So the results then suggest that the secreted IgG light chain, immunoglobulin light chain produced by this mouse myeloma cell, is smaller than the IgG light chain that we purified from cell-free translation product by uh, using the extracted messenger RNA in a cell-free protein synthesizing system. How might we interpret this? Well, th there's clearly a precursor IgG light chain that is produced during uh, translation by the ribosome reading a message. Somehow, before that precursor IgG leaves the cell, it is cleaved to a smaller polypeptide. So that's the interpretation of the actual observed results. Going a step further, the uh, investigators who did this work came up with a signal hypothesis. They suggested that the extra length of the IgG light chain could be due, or the extra size, could be due to additional amino acids somewhere in this uh, polypeptide that function as a traffic signal. They suggested the extra length might be necessary to direct a ribosome with a growing polypeptide to find the rough endoplasmic reticulum where secreted proteins are packaged. And another component of this hypothesis then is since what is secreted is actually smaller than what you make in a cell-free protein synthesizing system, there must be an enzyme in the rough endoplasmic reticulum that cuts off the signal peptide or the signal sequence, this extra group of amino acids, so that what's left is an IgG light chain of the correct size once it is secreted. We can test this hypothesis in the following manner. Here's our RNA extract again from cells that produce the IgG light chain only. We're going to do cell-free translation just as we did before, but this time we'll throw in some rough endoplasmic reticulum that we extracted from some of the cells in culture using differential centrifugation. We'll take the rough endoplasmic reticulum fraction of the cell and we'll throw it in to the cell-free translation system. The idea here being, of course, that if the RER is present during the cell-free translation, the protein that is produced will actually be produced inside the RER, and if there is an enzyme associated with RER that will cut off the traffic signal, then you should see a smaller peptide made inside the RER. So let's take a look. So we do that protein purification eventually. We throw away the uh, RER that was there. We extract IgG light chain using the same techniques we did earlier. Here's a polyacrylamide electrophoretic gel. We have the samples that we got from the prior experiment. We have radioactive IgG light chain that was made actually by cells and therefore is the smaller size. We have radioactive IgG light chain made by cell-free translation without rough endoplasmic reticulum being present. That's also from the last slide. And we have these molecular size markers that we can get off the shelf and put on this gel as well. And so we 
put each of these in one of the lanes. And so we have four samples, four lanes. We turn on the electrophoresis, we run the gel, we stain the gel. And once again, when you stain the gel, all you'll pick up are markers and the IgG light chain that was produced by the cells because there's lots of it. But now you put a piece of film on top of this gel and you allow time to expose the autoradiograph and then develop it. And this is what was found. Once again, the spot on the left represents material running in the second lane, which is that small amount of radioactive IgG that the cells actually made and secreted. The third lane, if you remember, contained the IgG light chain made by incorporating radioactive amino acids in a cell-free protein synthesizing system using RNA from these cultured cells. And finally, in the last lane, cell-free translation of RNAs extracted from cells in the presence of rough endoplasmic reticulum produces a protein of the correct or normal size, a, a protein we would call the mature IgG light chain molecule, the one that's the same size as the one secreted by the cell. So from this you can conclude that the rough endoplasmic reticulum, as was predicted, does have an enzymatic processing activity, that is to say it catalyzes the hydrolysis of the signal peptide that was assumed the extra amino acids. The RER has this enzymatic activity that catalyzes the hydrolysis of those signal peptide amino acids off, leaving a protein of the correct side. Here's the hypothesis. There is a signal peptide, that extra group of amino acids. These extra amino acids are, as one might predict, at the amino terminus of the protein. That's the part that, if you remember, comes out of the ribosome first during translation. That would make sense because what comes out of the tunnel in the ribosome to be exposed in the cytosol, in the cytoplasm. That first component is what to be recognized during uh, an attempt to associate with rough endoplasmic reticulum. And the RER, the rough endoplasmic reticulum enzymatic activity is called signal peptidase because it catalyzes the cleavage of the signal peptide. Here's what we know. There is a particle in the cytoplasm that actually recognizes the signal peptide as it emerges from a ribosome shown here on the left. It is called the signal recognition particle, or SRP. It binds to the signal sequence, to the amino terminal signal sequence, and the result, as we now know, is to arrest any further elongation, any further translation, which makes some sense. You don't want this polypeptide whose fate it is to go into the RER to be actually produced first in the cytosol because then it would be all folded up and it wouldn't be able to get into the RER. So the signal recognition particle binds, translation is arrested temporarily until the SRP encounters an SRP receptor on endoplasmic reticulum, on the what will become rough endoplasmic reticulum, and that's illustrated in the second component of the picture. Once that binding has occurred, the SRP itself is no longer necessary and it can be removed, and the ribosome associates with a, another protein in the RER called a translocation channel, which you see uh, two of here. One of them has nothing associated with it, but the one on the right, the light blue structure on the right, is actually associated with the large subunit of a ribosome translating a messenger RNA. And the polypeptide that is coming out is the green thread with the red signal peptide at the end. So, so far, we have the first part of the signal hypothesis, ending with the SRP detaching, and translation now able to resume with the protein being guided through the translocation channel into the lumen, the space, in the RER. Here are the next steps. It's not showing the ribosome here anymore, but it's there. The, the large subunit is still there. The polypeptide chain is still emerging from that uh, ribosomal large subunit channel and progressing through the translocation channel. At some point, a signal peptidase associated with the endoplasmic reticulum membrane associates with the translocation channel and catalyzes cleavage of the amino terminal signal peptide, which as you can see by the way, uh, remains associated with the actual uh, ER membrane. Historically it turned out that it was very difficult to isolate the signal peptide, that is, that is to show that when signal peptidase works, you get two products. You get a final mature protein at some point, and you get a signal peptide.
the reason the signal peptide wasn't found is people were looking at it in the liquid of the lumen and it wasn't there. It was actually associated with the ER membrane. So as this protein then continues to grow, eventually it is extruded into the lumen in its entirety, folded up now in its three-dimensional structure, but without the signal peptide. Shown in this illustration as well as there is another protein that is believed to plug up the channel when the channel is not in use. This is still in the realm of new science, so we're not entirely sure. Well, we've talked about how proteins that are to be packaged for secretion end up inside the RER. Proteins that end up in peroxisomes, in lysosomes, also go through this process. Earlier I showed you how cells are sugar-coated, and why the oligosaccharides on the surface of cells are only on the external surface of cells and not on the cytoplasmic surface. And I mentioned in showing you this that some proteins that are produced by ribosomes on the RER don't actually go all the way into the lumen, but become membrane proteins. How does that happen? That's what this slide is trying to show you. Proteins that are destined to stay in a membrane, to become membrane proteins, uh, transmembrane proteins in particular, contain something called a stop transfer sequence. Now, there are many different versions of this sequence, the stop transfer sequence, because it's not necessary that it be a very particular sequence. All that's really necessary is the stop transfer sequence be very hydrophobic, so that it in, it in fact is trapped in the phospholipid bilayer interacting with the fatty acid tails of the phospholipids. That stop transfer sequence leaves this polypeptide shown on the right embedded in the membrane, held in the membrane. If you remember how integral membrane proteins are structured, they have a strong helical region of hydrophobic amino acids that interact within the hydrophobic component of the phospholipid bilayer. Well, that's a stop transfer sequence, and here we see it in a cartoon form. Remember also that there were transmembrane proteins that actually crossed the membrane more than two or three or even four or five or six or seven times. Well, I'll show you just one that's crossed the membrane twice. Here we have an integral membrane protein that's crossed the membrane twice. It had two stop transfer sequences that, as the polypeptide grew, resulted in hydrophilic components facing either inside or outside the cell, but the hydrophobic stop transfer sequence ended up being buried in the phospholipid bilayer. And by the process shown in your textbook, but not really illustrated here, you could have this protein loop in and out of the membrane as it is being translated by a ribosome more than a few times, each time leaving behind a stop transfer sequence in the membrane. Let's talk a little bit about how proteins that belong in the nucleus get into the nucleus. There is something called a nuclear localization signal. An example is shown here. Proline, proline, lysine, lysine, arginine, lysine, valine. Proline and lysine and arginine all have amino groups, so they will confer a strong charge to this region of a protein. And that charge is shown on the left in the blue folded squiggled protein uh, as being positively charged. And that positive charge is important because it allows the protein destined to go into the nucleus to associate with a nuclear transport receptor, shown here in red, and having a negatively charged region which will interact very nicely with the uh, nuclear localization signal that is so positively charged. That compound structure of a nuclear protein produced in the cytoplasm, bound to its nuclear transport receptor, that structure can now find a nuclear pore shown in this illustration with its nuclear pore fibrils. And upon binding to the fibrils or interacting with the fibrils, the closed nuclear pore will open up and this protein will be actively transported along with the hydrolysis of ATP that you just should have seen. And the, both the transport protein and the protein that's intended to go into the nucleus end up inside the nucleus. So this is an active, very much an active transport process. Only proteins with a nuclear localization signal get in, and only those proteins intended to be in the nucleus have evolved to have such a signal. There's more than one kind of signal, but only those that are intended to go in the nucleus will actually have it. What about mitochondria? Remember I said that mitochondria, like chloroplasts, have their own DNA and can actually produce their own ribosomes and make their own proteins, but they don't make many of them. So here's how mitochondrial protein import occurs. We have a protein uh, in red in the cytoplasm with a green signal sequence, in this case, showing, interacting with a membrane receptor that links the outer membrane with the crystal membrane. 
So it's actually a protein complex that spans a cr the space, the intermembrane space of a mitochondrion and has protein components in the outer membrane and in the crystal membrane. And that's the receptor interacting with the protein. When that happens, there is a further interaction of the protein with another protein called HSP70. And those are the little black uh, structures. HSP70 are chaperone proteins that allow the protein produced in the cytoplasm to unfold and to cross a pore created by these membrane contact proteins. And the red protein that's going to end up inside of the mitochondrion is extruded through what is essentially a hydrophilic pore made up of membrane pro contact proteins that hold the inner and outer membrane together to allow this transport to occur. HSP70, a chaperone protein, allows the unfolding. HSP, by the way, stands for heat shock protein. Heat shock protein. It's a very interesting name. Heat shock proteins, as an aside, heat shock proteins were discovered in cells that were warmed up to temperatures higher than they normally live at. And all of a sudden, these cells stopped producing most proteins and started to produce heat shock protein because they were being made at higher temperatures. We also refer to them sometimes as stress protein. So, this cytosolic protein destined for the matrix of the mitochondrion is now being extruded through these membrane contact pore proteins. And once the, the polypeptide has gotten part of the way in, or as it gets in, heat shock proteins, HSP70, by the way, stands for the molecular weight, 70,000 Daltons. The same heat shock protein is present both in the cytoplasm and in the matrix. So the heat shock protein can associate with the polypeptide as it emerges in the matrix and begins to help it refold into its functional shape. And as it does that, a mitochondrial signal peptidase cleaves the signal peptide, which is an N-terminal peptide, cleaves it, and the signal peptide is eventually degraded. So that's how mitochondria get proteins from the cytosol. Something very similar, by the way, happens to get proteins from the cytosol of a plant cell into chloroplasts. That brings us to an end of how proteins are uh, correctly targeted to different organelles.